right? And we want to, I want to give you the, the, the facts about the political situation on the ground because a lot of people don't know. And if we, do, if we pastors don't tell people, who's going to tell them? Where are they going to get it? Right? All right, so we saw last time that uh, the Babylonians destroyed Philistia. They pretty much wiped it out. And they took the people captive. And Philistia was never heard of again after the Babylonian time. All right? Uh, That's important because Palestine comes from the term Philistia. And so there there are no Philistines anymore. Uh, there may ha- there may be, you know, remnants that are mixed in with all the other peoples, but there's no separate people called Philist- Philistines. You get it? Okay. Um, but what we do see is Idumea or Edom. Uh, I don't know if you can see it there. It's a small little map, but couldn't make it any bigger. But you see. The Edom was taken over by the Nabataeans. They were like Arab tribes. They drove them out, and they were they moved um, they moved westward into into Judah. And when Judah was was sent off into exile in Babylon, they started taking over the cities in the Negev, in the desert, and they moved on up eventually. But this is a map of the time of Jesus. You see it now. All the other places, Edom, uh, Edom. Is not in the hills anymore. It's over here. But Philistia is gone. Uh, Moab is gone. Um, I, I, what's the other one? Mo, Ammon. I am the sons of Ammon. They're gone. Okay. Now these peoples obviously mixed in with the Arabs because the Arabs took over this whole area, Arabia. Okay. There's always been Arabia. You know that. Yeah. Arabia has been around since Ishmael. You know that Arabia, the Arabs, come from Ishmael. Edom comes from uh, Esau, right? So it's, it's uh, Jacob's, um, uh, Jacob's half-brother. I'm not half-brother, but twin brother. His twin brother, right? And uh, so the enmity between the Ishmaelites and, and uh, uh, Isaac, right, between Ishmael and Isaac, because Ishmael always was jealous of Isaac for getting the promise, right? And then uh, between Esau and Jacob, Esau was jealous of Jacob, was angry with Jacob, and apparently he spread that to his descendants. And they were always enemies of Israel, always trying to destroy them, right? And so it is today. We see the, the ancient hatred is still with us today. So you have to see that angle. If you don't, you won't understand why the hatred, why the anger. It's age-old, and it, it's, a, it's a real proof that if we don't deal with things that come down the family line, they continue on. It's a real proof of it, isn't it? Okay. Um, but what I wanted to show you from that map is Edomia is actually what Edom was called by the Romans. It's Edomia, and that's the only one that seems to have survived, and yet it's the one that has the harshest uh, words of the prophets. All the prophets spoke against Edom, and Obadiah said they would have no descendants left. They would be completely wiped out. Okay? Just wanted you to keep that in the back of your head, and let's keep going. So we saw that Hadrian renamed the whole area in the Roman Empire. He wiped out all um, history of the Jews as much as he could, but obviously he couldn't do it. And even today, uh, what they are discovering in Jerusalem is just unbelievable. I don't know if you know it, but they keep uncovering these amazing things. They have literally, well, a few years ago, they found the Pool of Siloam, and it was an incredible find. They were actually, there was a water main break, and the water was pouring out all over, and the, the crew went down to, to dig, to dig, to fix the pipes, and they found the Pool of Siloam. <laughs> and these all these incredible steps. Did you all know what the Pool of Siloam is? That's where 
where the blind man was healed, or the people used to go down to the city of David, on the very bottom of the slope of Moriah, and they would wash there, and then they would go up the pilgrim road all the way up to the temple. And they would sing songs of ascent as they went up to the temple to worship. There's a whole lot more to the temple than, than we understand. That's another whole subject. But then when they found the Pool of Siloam, they said, there must, well, where's the road then? We know there's a road here because it's all in the writings and everything. And so they started digging. And they have uncovered the whole pilgrim road that's going right up underneath the, the city, modern city, and right up to the Temple Mount. So all this stuff is being uncovered as we speak. Do you think there's a reason why it's all coming out now? Anyway, uh, but Hadrian wanted to eradicate the memory of, of the Jews. He, he really turned against the Jews because of the revolts. And uh, so he named the whole area Palestine. Actually, Palestina in, in uh, Latin. And why did he do that? After Israel's ancient enemies, the Philistines. Okay, so that's where the term Palestine came from. How many of you knew that? One person. I think the rest of you knew too. You just don't have the energy to say. <laughs> um, now, last week we stopped here with the dry bones, Ezekiel's dry bones, right? And we saw that the, the dry bones were the whole house of Israel. There was so lost hope throughout the nations. It says, uh, our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. And we saw how that continued on and how they were oppressed and persecuted in every place they went. Because, uh, you know, Moses said, the Lord will draw out a sword after you. So they have been oppressed for 2,000 years. And uh, in the 20th century, this prophecy was partially fulfilled. Most of it was fulfilled. We're still waiting for the second part, for the Spirit to be breathed into them. All right. Um, now, a little story here. Uh, have you ever heard of the Ottoman Turks? Okay. The Ottoman Empire ruled the Middle East up until 1917, to World War I. And uh, what you might not have heard is this prophecy by a guy named Judah ben Samuel in 1210, uh, excuse me, 1217. He gave a prophecy that has so far proven to be accurate, with only the final part of it remaining to be fulfilled. So just disclaimer here, we are not in the habit of uh, talking about prophecies that come from non-Christians, okay? Or non-biblical prophecies that come from non-Christians. But uh, in this case, this is a Jewish rabbi, who is a, he's a godly man who's seeking the kingdom of God and the restoration of Israel. He doesn't know Yeshua, right? So, but the real reason we're talking about the prophecy is because it came to pass. So God must have spoken to him. Anyway, it's very interesting. So the Ottoman Turks took over the Middle East, uh, uh, took over Israel or, or Palestine, as it was called then, in uh, fifth, uh, in. 1517, okay? Now, here was the prophecy. When the Ottoman Turks conquer Jerusalem, they will rule over Jerusalem for eight jubilees. Eight jubilees, eight times 50, is 400 years. And how long did they rule over Israel? 400 years, from 1517 to, 15, uh, to 1917. 400 years, right? So that gets my attention right away. Got the first part right. Now, he, he prophesied this in 1217, 300 years before it happened. <coughs> kind of impressive, don't you think? Yeah. All right, then he said, Afterward, Jerusalem will become a no man's land for one jubilee, 50 years. And then in the ninth jubilee, it will once again come back into the possession of the Jewish nation, which would signify the beginning of the messianic end time. Oh, this is coming from a, a rabbi in 1217. So, uh, so no, it's very interesting that Jerusalem, after 
um, that Jer Jer after World War I, there was East and West Jerusalem were separated, and there was a whole area in East Jerusalem known, and guess what it was called? No Man's Land. And it was up until 1967 when Israel took back the old city of Jerusalem. It just kind of fell into their hands. Uh, by God, of course. It was arranged by the Lord, right? Right? The reason we're telling you all this is because this is what God did. And this is what God is doing. All right, so uh, 1917, their reign ended 400 years. Now the Jubilee, 1917 times plus 50 brings us to 1967 when the Jews took back the city. And then the rabbi said, we, are at, we enter the Messianic era. And we've been telling you that all along. Since 1967, we have been in the second part of the regathering of Israel, which is them coming back to the, Messiah, coming back to the Lord and to the Messiah. Scripture says they will, come, uh, they will come to the Lord, come trembling to the Lord in the last days, and to uh, David their king. Who's the king? Jesus. Yeshua. Jesus, right? Amen? Amen. 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 Yeah, sure. <laughs> Come on, you guys. All right. I know some of you uh, feel like you've heard this before, but there's stuff you haven't heard before as well. Anyway, 1897 uh, was the beginning of the restoration of the nation of Israel. Uh, a man named Theodore Herzl, who was not really a believer. Right. He was raised up by God. He was not a believer. You know, God can raise up people that are not believers. Right. And he can use them, like Cyrus, mm -hmm. like Trump, yeah. dare I say. Although he's a believer, but I don't think he really knew the Lord when God raised him up. I hope he does now. But it doesn't matter. God will use anybody. And so we have to accept, and that's a digress for a second here, that t also tells us that we have to accept the way things are now, even though we don't like them. Because if God raises up one, and ra he can raise up another, and sometimes he raises up people that we don't like. Amen? And why does he do that? Because we get what we deserve. That's another whole story, but God is at work to will and to do his good pleasure. He wants all of us. He's going to work it all out for our good and for his glory. Amen? But he uses wicked people sometimes to accomplish his purposes. And he uses people who don't even know. So Herzl didn't even know, I don't think, what he was doing. But he had this thing in his spirit that he, need, he needed, uh, God, there needed to be a place for the Jewish people. They needed to have their own home, their own country. Because he saw them being persecuted in Europe. And so he started something called the World Zionist Congress in 1897. And it was the beginning of the official regathering of Israel back to the land. Seventy years later, a gen whole generation, 70 years is a generation, 70 years later, not only are they back in the land, but they're back in the city of Jerusalem. Amen? Amen? And since then, 1967, uh, as, the, as the rabbi said, we're in the Messianic era, we have been in part two. God said, I will bring you back to the land, period. Yeah. Then he said, I will bring you back to myself. I will pour clean water on you and so on. And I will, I will put my spirit in you. That's where we're at right now. We're in the tail end of that. We're ready for that to happen. Amen. Amen. But there's going to be some major world difficulties before it happens. And so you heard it here first. You can tell people, I knew that. I knew that was coming. Doesn't it feel good to know what's coming? Well, you'd just rather hear about being blessed. Okay. After the Ottoman Empire, the, uh, the 
the Ottomans, by the way, Herzl went to the Ottoman Empire and he pleaded with them to give uh, the Jews a place in, in the land in, the, in Palestine, and they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't, he went there three times, and they wouldn't even talk about it. And by the way, the land was desolate. The land of pa so-called Palestine was desolate until the Jews came back. And God said it would be. He would drive them out of the land, and the land would be desolate. The, the land and the people are, are linked together forever. So the land, didn't, what, the land became barren when the people weren't there. And for 2,000 years, there were, uh, you know, remnants of, of folks in the land. By the way, there were always Jews in the land. The idea that there were no more Jews in, in, in the area called Palestine is not true. There have always been Jews there. There have always been Arabs there. But there was nobody doing anything with the land. It was desolate. When Mark Twain went there in the mid-1800s, uh, he, he said it was a mal malaria swamp. He said it was a terrible place. And he was shocked at how desolate it was. But he, went, he was testifying of what God had done. And then within a generation, the desert is blooming. And, and, and Israel is exporting fruits and vegetables all over Europe. They have come a little tiny bit of land that's mostly desert, and they are flooding Europe with their produce. It's incredible. Okay, uh, so what are you looking at here? You're looking at a map of the Ottoman Empire, and when the Ottoman Empire fell to the British in uh, 1917, World War I. By the way, World War I was all about bringing, giving the Jews a homeland. And World War II was all about bringing them home. You say, well, it was about something else. No, it wasn't. It started with something else, but it ended up <laughs> being about Israel. And World War II started with something else and ended up being about Israel. And the next war that starts will, will be start off with some, maybe China or something else. It's going to end up being about Israel. Amen. And it's going to be about the temple this time. Because it's the only piece left for their for their uh, spiritual, uh, their spiritual restoration. Amen. And I, I tell you here today, they're going to rebuild the temple before anything else happens. You say, well, that's not going to happen. Well, that's what people said about Israel coming back. That's what they said about them being a nation again. People laughed at Herzl and said, "That's never going to happen. You're crazy." You're loony. Right? And in, in 1946, uh, they said, well, uh, Jerusalem will always be divided. Two years later, it's no longer divided. And now people say they'll never build a temple again. And I'm telling you, they will. Okay, why do I say that? Because it's in the Bible. That's why I'm so sure. All right, now, there's a whole lot of issues with that. I know you're all thinking, well, you know, what that... And by the way, it's going to be God's temple. It's not going to be Antichrist temple. Amen. People say, oh, that's the Antichrist temple. No, the Antichrist will defile it. That's what the scripture says. He's going to set up an abomination in it. Now, if, he, if it were his temple, then the whole thing would be abomination. And now he couldn't fulfill that word. So obviously, Paul said he will take his seat in the temple of God. So it has to be a temple there for him to do that, for that prophecy to be fulfilled. Right? Okay. Um, so now, you see what's going on. How am I doing? I'm doing okay. I've got to keep moving, though. You see how the, the, is, uh, the whole Ottoman Empire then ha fell into British hands and something called the League of Nations. You ever heard of that? All right, so... What most people don't realize, they think that, that uh, the British created the state of Israel and all the rest of them are just kind of uh, ignored. That's what, a lot of, that's what the media wants everybody to think. That's, that's a lie. If the truth is that the British and the French created all those nations. There was no Iraq. 
Iraq was created by the British. Syria was created by the British. Lebanon was taken over by the French. And Turkey continued to be, well, actually, they were in Syria to the French. But it was between them. They made agreements, right? And so now, do you see this land here? Do you see this, all this land here? That was the British mandate. The British mandate was given to them by the League of Nations. After World War I, the nations of Europe got together and said, we don't want any more war in our continent. How can we avoid it? And, of course, they went down the, the One World, New World Order road and formed something called the League of Nations, which eventually led to the United Nations. Okay? But they gave uh, Britain the mandate to establish a homeland for the Jewish people. Now, how could that happen unless God did it? Right? None of those nations would do that today. So it was a time, it was God's time. And God had the right people there. And by the way, he raised up a bunch of Christians in England who were the ones, primary movers and shapers behind this whole thing. Amen? So God can use Christians to restore Israel. Amen. And has. I don't know how that fits into your theology, but I don't know about you, but I want the Messiah to come. That's my motivation. And I want Israel to be restored to Messiah. Amen? Okay. So, now look at that territory. It's all of Jordan today. It reaches right up to the border. It's actually very close to the territory given to Abraham. Now, that was uh, 1917, okay? We go on, you see it now, there's a better map of it. Now, that whole area was called Palestine, and uh, this is really important. You have to understand that everybody living there was called a Palestinian. The Jews were called Palestinians. Everybody who lived in the land, it was just a term given to the people who lived in the land. And there was no, never a nation of Palestinians. That, that never has been the case, ever. They were just tribes of people, the Arabs mostly. But I believe, since Idumea never went away, I believe that uh, the current Palestinians are probably, likely, descendants of Edom. Okay? Although they are mixed in with other groups, Arab groups as well. So that's interesting, isn't it? Okay, in light of biblical prophecy, that's very interesting. But until 1948, everybody was called, called a Palestinian. The Jerusalem Post, you've heard of the Jerusalem Post? It's actually a Christian paper. Uh, it was called the Palestinian Post until 1948. So this is a really important point. When you hear people saying how the Palestinians are being oppressed by Israel and how they did this and that and the other, it's all lies. Now, by the way, do you know who the people are that are oppressed in, in uh, Israel today? Do you know who they are? Do you know who, who's oppressing the Palestinians? The Palestinians. And the Palestinians don't, I don't want the Palestinians to, to be oppressed, do you? No, but it, who's oppressing them are terrorist organizations led by Iran, Hamas, Right? And uh, Fatah, which is, and, and they have no, uh, they, they talk about elections, but they never give them any elections, you know, that? never. So they are controlled by these people, and they're brutalized by them. And if they cooperate with Israel in any way, they drag them through the streets. There's no justice, they just, they're just a bunch of terrorist thugs who brutalize anyone who goes against them. And that's who's ruling. The, and that's who the world is happy that they're ruling. And these are the people they're funding like millions of dollars to every year. And it's all going into their pockets. And the people are getting nothing. Right. And the world thinks that's right. That's how corrupt our world is. But I tell you someone who doesn't think it's right. Do you know who that is? Yeah, very good. Very perceptive. 
<laughs> All right, let's move on to the British. And by the way, the British was a great, they were a great empire. British did great things. And I'm speaking as an Irishman who was raised to hate the British, okay? <laughs> they, did, they did a lot of bad things, especially to the Irish, but they did great things too. And we all owe our language to them. Amen. And we owe the advancement of the gospel to them around the world. Amen? Amen? They did great things. But they messed with Israel. And they reneged on the Jewish people. They, by the time of, um, what year are we here? 1922. From 1917 to 1922, they caved in to the Arabs. And this is the, now they have cut off this whole section here. And they gave it over to the Hashemites. This was all supposed to be Israel. But they cut this big section off. And they gave it, they created a state called Jordan. Okay? And it's actually Palestinian state. It, it, you can talk about a Palestinian state. That is a Palestinian state. It's mostly all Palestinians that live there. People who've always lived in, in that area. And likely there are some mixed tribes in there, probably some descendants of Moab and Ammon survived. There. One would have to think there was a remnant that survived, right? Okay, so why is this important? I just want to show you how the situation came about, all right, that it currently exists, and why it exists, and what's going to happen next. You all right with that? Because you're going to read about it in the paper. Well, no, you're not, because we don't read papers anymore. You're going to read about it on the Internet, one morning you're going to wake up and you're going to read what I'm telling you and you're going to say, wow, I guess he was right after all. Amen. So they changed it and they created Jordan. The Hashemites, by the way, uh, did never had their own kingdom. They, they ruled, they were, the, they were a royal group that were responsible for taking care of Mecca, the holy places. And uh, Winston Churchill, the British, decided to give them this whole territory to, because they helped them with the war, so it was a payback thing. And they, they, they just, so they took it away from the Jews. All right, so this is what they were supposed to get in 1922, that territory there. Right? Okay. Judea and Samaria, ancient Judea and Samaria at the time of Jesus. Now, you know the story, uh, World War II. And you know how the ships came to bring the Jews back? There's one of them right there. And the British came up with something called the white paper because they didn't want the Jews coming back. So they completely turned against the Jews. And, and after being brutalized with the Holocaust, they're trying to get away from Germany. And what did the British do? They send them back to Germany. And why am I telling you that? Because after this, these events, Britain fell apart. Yeah. It lost its empire yeah. and it was, it's no longer Great Britain. Yeah. It used to be Great Britain. Yeah. Okay? And, and, and they can hardly hold on to Scotland at this point. It's right. like very small. Now they still got a lot of power and they're good people so I have lots of friends. You know, I'm not saying anything about the Brits. I respect the Brits but I'm just telling you anyone who messes with Israel pays a price. And we are paying the price for trying to divide the land. Right, right now, our country is hopelessly divided. Amen. I say hopelessly because I don't see it being put back together. Amen. Not because I don't have faith. I just see it as judgment from God. Amen. Okay? As God is going to take care of us, He's going to help us. He hasn't given up on us. Amen. But the situ it is what it is, as they say. There's a reason. Amen. Right? So... Here's the ships coming, and this is God fulfilling his word. He said, I will take you from all the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. There's a reason why the ships didn't go. They went to Canada, they went to the United States, and they were not laid in anywhere. And there's a reason for that. You know what it was? Because they're supposed to go back to Israel. God said, I will take you from all the lands and bring you back to your own land. Who, whose land is it? 
Well, whose land? Read the verse, honey. Whose land is it? Yes, their land. It's all, God says it's his land, and he says his land is the Jews' land. So I think that's good enough for me. If God says it's their land, what do you think? All right. Who, which, who do you think is going to win, God or the nations? Now, see, this is what we need to see. This is not just about Israel. This is the nations against God. That's what it's going to come down to. The end of the age is going to be the nations against God. God pouring out judgment on Gentile nations for the way they've treated Israel. That's what the, that's what the tribulation is mostly about. Of course, it's judgment on all, on all peoples, right? But uh, God is not coming to judge Israel anymore. He's going to sift them, but it's not like the first century. This time, God's going to fight for them. This time, God's fighting for them. And I don't know about you, I want to be on God's side. Aren't you agree? All right, so 1947... The situation was dire. The British pulled out. Their, uh, their solution was to just leave. I leave at a mess. Complete mess with all kinds of fighting going on and everything else. And 1947, November the 29th, uh, the United Nations uh, came up with something called the Partition Plan, which was going to divide the territory that was supposed to be given to Israel. Are you there? The second time around, they divided the, all that yellow part. They wanted to create an a, uh, Arab state. And all the rest of it, this uh, red part here, or whatever color it is, they wanted to give to Israel. And it's mostly all desert down here. This is all desert. And this is Judea and Samaria, biblically. That they were going to give it to the Arabs. Are you there? So basically, they're giving more and more and more and more away, giving Israel a little sliver. So they proposed this, and the UN partition plan was voted on and approved. And guess what? Israel accepted it. Now, Israel wasn't Israel at the time. The Jews in the land said, okay, we'll take it. Even though you're giving us nothing, we'll take it. But guess what? The Arabs said, no, we won't take it. You know why they said they wouldn't take it? Because they want it all. They do not want Israel to exist. Right? And so war, of course, broke out. And in 1948, Israel was declared, declared the state. The state of Israel was born. And the scripture says in Isaiah 66, Can, Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Can a land be born in a day? Can a nation be given birth all at once? The answer is, it happened. One day, Israel was born, just like that. And the next day, it was attacked. Of course, it was recognized by the United States immediately, like within hours. Because Truman was prepared by the Lord for this very day. Do you think that God might be in charge and in control Hello? There are teachers out there saying God's not in control. Big ones. Big, well-known people. I'd like to slap them. Can I do that, Lord? Can I slap them someday and say, look, how dare you say God's not in control? What Bible are you reading? No, I wouldn't slap them. I pray for them. I do pray for them come to their senses. Heaven help us. If God's not in control, we're in big trouble. But aren't you glad he's in control? And the proof is in history. Just look at, somebody said history is his story. All right, I got to move here if I want to finish. But I think I'm okay. So the next day, Israel is declared, the next day, five Arab armies attacked the new state. They hardly had nothing. They, did, they had a couple, I think they had a half a dozen tanks that they commandeered. And they, they, had, no, they had no military, really. They were just 
uh, groups that, you know, like militia groups is all they had. No standing army. They're attacked by five well-developed and armies of five Arab nations the next day. Did you know that? Yes. Well, you know that. Because <laughs> you've heard me say that uh, many, many times. Yes, but that's a fact. And guess what? What happened? They won. They won because God fought for them just like in the Bible. And there are many testimonies of the things that God did. Whole Egyptian armies just running away from thinking they saw all these tanks and everything coming, and they weren't there. <laughs> there are so many stories like that. It's just like the Bible. In fact, there's a whole series called Against All Odds. If you want to look it up, uh, there's a whole video series where, they te- where there's all these testimonies of the things that God did from people who were in the war. All right. And against all odds, Israel prevailed and fought back five Arab, Arab nations. Yes. You think that's a miracle? Yes, it's a miracle. Okay. Now, uh, this is where the refugees came from, and uh, I need to point this out. Uh, a lot of, uh, now, there were always a lot of Jews in the land. Well, not a lot, but a, a minority, a small minority, okay? Let's say it that way. But it grew over the years. And by the 20s, they're coming back because they're anticipating what God's doing, right? So they're called Palestinians, but they're also Arabs that are, as Israel is coming back, the Arabs are, are starting to come in as well. So the numbers are increasing, but they're all Palestinians at this point. Are you there? Okay. So, um, but the Arab nations that were going to invade, they told all these people, uh, these people in the land, Palestinians, they told them to, uh, to leave and, and that it would just be a matter of destroying Israel, be all over in a day, and then they could all come back and have all their houses and everything else. And so that's why they left. And the Jews pleaded with them not to go, their neighbors, but they went. And guess what? Israel won. And then a lot of them didn't want to come back, and some of them did, but a lot of them didn't come back. And the Arab nations didn't take care of them. They didn't absorb them in. They put them in camps, and many of them are still in those camps today. But, of course, it's all Israel's fault. Right? You can tell which side I'm on, right? You can tell, can't you? Yeah. But there's a reason. It's God's side. If God were on the other side, I'd be on the other side, but God's on this side. Now, I want to tell you there are a lot of Palestinians who are Christians. There are Palestinians who have this understanding, and not just, not just me, okay? There are, there are good, godly Palestinians who believe what I've... Not a lot, but there are some. There are churches in uh, some of those t- places that are... And you can't, they can't even tell you who they are because they'd be murdered. All right? We have friends in Israel, and they know stuff. In fact, we support a ministry that brings food and so forth to some of these people. So please don't think that I'm against the Palestinian people. I'm not. I'm against their leaders because they're not leaders. Okay? And they're enemies of God, and that's what you need to understand. Now, uh, it happened again in 1967, and uh, uh, Egypt, under uh, Nasser, provoked war. And he even moved his troops into the Sinai, and he had all the other uh, nations, Jordan, uh, Syria. uh, He had them on the alert to attack Israel. And and it it was all over the news, and everybody knew they were going to attack Israel. And so Israel uh, did a preemptive strike. They had no choice. If they waited, they would probably be in dire situation. So they they hit the Egyptian uh, plane. All the Egyptian planes, I think 300 of them were taken out in a matter of an hour. They just flew over Egypt, a surprise attack, and blew up all their planes. (laughs) And the war started in in the Six-Day War. It was all over in six days. And when it had ended... Israel is bigger. 
When it had ended, Israel had taken all of what they call the West Bank, which is Judea and Samaria, biblically. They'd taken the Golan Heights, and they'd taken all of Sinai. This was all because of the results of the war. Now, as you know, Sinai was given back to Egypt in, in, by the, in the 70s with the Camp David Accord. No, the, the um, Jimmy Carter's peace deal. Okay? No, that was later. It was in Camp David, but it wasn't called that. Okay? Are you with me so far? Now, who's this guy? His name is Yasser Arafat. It's before some of your time, but he, he actually is the one who created the, the Palestinians. He came up with the term, created it, uh, and they promoting this propaganda that the Palestinians had their state taken away from them, which is a complete lie, because it's never existed, right. right? And he started the PLO, well, he led the PLO, and he... Uh, all they did was bombs. They bombed uh, a bunch of innocent people in, in Germany, and they, uh, it, Jews at an at a Olympic thing, and they blew up uh, cities around Israel. They planted bombs everywhere. And this went on for years. Many of you remember that time? Okay, some of you. So that's where all this current, and it's terrorism, and it's generated by Satan himself. You understand? Who is trying to destroy. He wants to destroy the Jews because he knows his goose is cooked. You understand? So please understand, it's, there are spiritual powers behind this. It's not just humans. Humans fall into sp uh, spiritual, into evil because of the stuff in their heart. Right? But there's a spiritual power behind this that is against God. And it's in all the nations. And all, you see all the nations. They're always standing on the wrong side. They're always discriminating against Israel, aren't they? No matter what happens, it's Israel's fault. They, they shot 400 missiles last night. And Israel responded. They're the terror. They call Israel the, the ones perpetrating the violence. And many of you know that's the media. Right? And what that is, is the nations being indicted, okay? In, in January, uh, at the end of, of um, Obama's term, in January, I think it was uh, uh, 2017, right? Uh, he, he, they convened the United Nations, and 70 nations voted against Israel, 70, and the number 70, of course, represents all the nations, because there were 70 nations in Genesis, right? And see, that was a prophetic act, saying the nations are against Israel. Are you there? Now, let's get to the spiritual side of things to wrap this up. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, this is what the Lord says, the Lord God says, it's not for your sake, house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name. Okay? So God's saying, it's not because of anything Israel did. It's not because of anything the Jewish people did. That it's not because of their behavior that God's going to act. He's going to act because of his holy name. Right? He said, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. And I will, see, please understand, it, we're, it, the, the Supporting Israel does not mean that we support everything that the people do. Okay? It doesn't mean we agree with everything they say. We're supporting God's people. Because God has chosen them to be his nation in the earth. That's why we support them. Amen? So we're really supporting God's purposes. We realize that Israel is not yet repentant in a place where they've come back to God. But it's coming. Amen. Amen. And what will it be? What kind of day will it be? Paul said if, if their destruction was life to the nations, what will their acceptance be? What will their restoration be? But life from the dead. So this is something, guys, this is why we look forward to it. Because it's, it's a big part of the final end time. It's a big part of the restoration 
that we all seek and we all look for is the coming of Jesus and the kingdom of God. This is a big section of it right here. Okay. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord. Are we there yet? No, but the nations are going to know that he is the Lord. Amen. Why? Because he's going to show himself holy among you in their sight. God is going to do things in our days that are going to shake the nations. God is going to gather all the nations and judge them, and he's going to pour out wrath on them, and he's going to deliver Israel. And the nations are going to know from then on, the word of God says, that he is the Lord. How many of you want that? How many of you are excited about that? Amen. That's what we all want. For I will, here's the, pro the prophecy in Ezekiel uh, 36. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. We read that part already. That's step one, phase one. Physical regathering, not conditional. God says, I'm going to do it for my name's sake. Amen? So it's like, well, if you do, it's not if you do this, I'll do that. No, I'm going to do it. And he did it. And it's done. Amen? But then there's part two. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean, and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. That's the new covenant that we enjoy. Right? And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Meaning a heart that's responsive to God, not one that's always obstinate and going against him. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful and observe my ordinances, and you will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers, so you will be my people, and I will be your God. Okay. How many of you know that hasn't happened yet? And it's not for the church. The new covenant's for the church, but this portion of Scripture is not about the church. It's about Israel. Amen? Isn't that good? So God says they're in their land. He brought them back to their land. And anyone who divides that land, he's going to judge. Amen? Amen? Here we go. I'm going to read it to you. Uh, Joel chapter 3. For behold, in those days, and at that time, what time is it? When I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. Has God restored the fortunes? fortunes of Judah, Jerusalem. I've been there 21 times. I know he has. Amen? So in, at that time is now, today. I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat in Jerusalem. Then I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my inheritance, Israel, just in case you think it's the church, whom they have scattered among the nations, and they have divided up my land. So God says it's his land, but he also says it's their land. And anyone who messes with it has a problem with God. And he says he's going to take action. When God says he's going to take action on something, you can bet he's going to do it. Amen? Amen? Now, if that's not true, then you might as well give up as a Christian because you don't have any guarantee God's promises will be fulfilled to you. But of course, we know that God keeps his promises. God is faithful. And the fact that he has been faithful to Israel is the greatest testimony there is that he's going to be faithful to us as well. Amen? Amen? Amen. What a great thing that is. What a great... That's reason to celebrate. It's not like, no, God is faithful in the Bible. No, God is faithful today. God has carried out his word today in our generation, right now. Amazing things has he done and continues to do. So you should have great hope hearing these words. That what's going on in the world is not all 
you know, disaster. God is at work. But the chaos is going to end. The destruction is going to end. The time is coming. The unrighteousness, the evil is going to be done away with. Boy, you should have shouted for that. You should have been jumping up and down for that. Maybe you want all the evil to be done away with. Well, I got news. It's not going to be the church that's going to do away with it. It's going to be God. The messianic kingdom. Jesus is the one who will deal with it. Personally. Amen? Amen? And I'm, I'm ready for that. Then he says, I will enter into judgment. I'll look at... Uh, uh, further down the, cha- down the chapter, he says, I like to read the whole chapter. We just don't have time. I like to go through the whole. I like to keep everything in context so we can understand what he's saying. The Lord roars from Zion. Jerusalem. That's Mount Zion. That is the Mount Moriah where the temple once stood. Are you there? Where Jesus is going to reign from. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem And the heavens and the earth quake. That's what's coming. But the Lord is a refuge for his people and a stronghold for the sons of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God dwelling on Zion, my holy mountain. So Jerusalem will be holy and strangers will no longer pass through it. This is what's coming in the millennium. Did you know the reign of Jesus that people are go- all the nations are going to go up to Jerusalem every year and celebrate the feasts? Mm-hmm. That's right. So maybe you had a different plan for maybe you were thinking well, you should just kind of play harps or do things something else but no this is what's coming. Mm-hmm. For a thousand years. Mm-hmm. What are you going to be doing during that time? <coughs> Anybody know what you're going to be doing? What are you going to be doing? If you're with Jesus and you're next to him, you're going to be ruling and reigning with him in a glorified body like he is. Amen? Amen? Okay. Now, back to the word again. Uh, Well, I've explained it all to you, haven't I? What What the old rabbi said. All right? But there... The Jubilee, here's why I went back to it. The Jubilee, he said the first, there would be eight Jubilees, 400 years, that the Turks would, would, would uh, have the land, right? The Holy Land, we're going to call it. And then there would be another Jubilee, 50 years, where it would be a no man's land, Jerusalem, right? And then we'd enter the Messianic era. Well, did you know the next Jubilee then would be from 1967 to 2017? Did anything significant happen in 2017, relating to Jerusalem. We were watching it because we knew something had to happen in 2017. What happened? What happened? We had a declaration by the President of the United States that Jerusalem belonged to the people of Israel. Hello? It shook the world, didn't it? Shook the whole world. They went crazy. They really went crazy. And the Jews made this coin. They have Cyrus and Trump on the same coin. Because what he did was a Cyrus thing. And if he never does another thing in his life, God raised him up for that. Are you there? So, folks, we're on target for the end of the age here. The evidence is everywhere. Now, what I believe the next major prophetic event to take place is going to be the building of the temple. Amen. But there's gonna, it's going to take war for it to happen. And did you know that there's a, a large segment of Jews that are ready to do it now? They have everything prepared. It took them the last, uh, they've been at it since 1967. But they're ready to go. They have everything needed. Amen? Amen. Does that excite you? Yes. Are you one of those Christians who say, what do we need that for? <laughs> no, really. Uh, you want to get controversy going? Yes. You mentioned the temple. They'll think you are loony. Yes. 
But what are they going to do when it happens? It's going to be a huge divide among Christians. Amen. Warning you. You heard it here first. It's going to be a huge divide. Uh, right now, it, Christians are divided over Israel. But it's going to be, once that temple appears, it's going to be all-out war. It's going to be those who are with the Jews and those who are against them. Mark my words on that. I'm not, I'm telling you the truth. Do I want it to be that way? No, but it's going to be that way. All right. I'm almost done, believe it or not. How many of you believe me? I have faith that I'm nearly done. This is all prophetic stuff, and I should excite you. If you love Jesus and you want the kingdom to come, this should excite you. If it doesn't excite you, something's, quite, something's wrong with your worldview. If it doesn't excite you. Okay. What am I looking at now? We're looking at Ezekiel 38 and 39, the Gog and Magog war, right? Now, Ezekiel said that God's going to bring these nations, Gog and Magog, and the names come from the ancient names, from, from uh, Noah, okay? Noah's sons and their sons. That's where the names come from. God still looks at them with those names. That's right. Isn't it? See, God sees everybody. Nobody's dead to God. To us, they're all dead, but not to God, they're not. That's what Jesus said. You know, Abraham, I, he's not the God of the dead, but of the living. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive. Hello? Okay, so what are they? They're ro mostly Russia, Persia, which is Iran. You've got uh, Meshach and Tubal, which is Turkey. And you've got Kush, which is, uh, what, is it Somalia today? Uh, it's, it's Ethiopia, but it's a, a good chunk of it in those days. A good chunk of it is, um, I think it's Somalia today. Could be wrong on that. Put is, is Libya. Libya. All these nations right now are all aligned against Israel, and they're all in this alliance, and they will be in this war when it comes. Okay. Now, I don't believe that war is next. Some teachers believe that's next. I don't. And the reason I don't is because when you read it, it says that after that war, God will never allow his name to be profaned anymore. That's why I believe it's part of the Armageddon campaign at the end of the tribulation. Okay? But there could be, they're all aligned together right now, and there could be some kind of a precursor, a war to, that's similar to that. But here's what is likely, and we're, and we're done. Just going to finish with this. Um, there's, there's a whole uh, passage in Psalm 83. I don't know if you guys have ever read Psalm 83, but we're just going to read it now. Okay, God, do not remain quiet. Do not be silent. And God, do not be still, for behold, your enemies make an uproar, and those who hate you have exalted themselves. They make shrewd plans against your people and conspire together against your treasured ones. They have said, come and let's wipe them out as a nation. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. So that the name of Israel will no longer be remembered. For they have conspired together with one mind. They make a covenant against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, the Moab and the Hagrites, Gebel, Ammon, and Amalek, Philistia, and the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria, and also has joined them. They have become a help to the nation of Lot. By the way, Moab and Ammon were the sons of Lot, okay? That's Psalm 83. Now, many think that's what's next. I, I'm inclined to agree. You remember, in both wars, Israel took territory. Could, could it be that they're going to take more territory? Could it be that Jordan will actually fall into Israel's hands? Well, here's the thing that, now these are the nations here that were just mentioned, okay? The, 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 the tents of Edom are essentially the Palestinians. Ishmaelites are Arabs. Hagrites are clan of Ishmaelites. Inhabitants of Tyre, the Lebanese. And you know how it was taken over by Hezbollah, who wants to destroy Israel, right? 
Uh, then we have the descendants of Lot, the Moabites and Ammonites, and that's Jordan today, which is enemy of Israel, although they pretend not to be. But if war starts, they cannot be trusted. Okay? So, these... Now, here's the deal. They are not mentioned in the Gog Magog War, so where did they go? A few years later, they're not mentioned. So that leads us to think that, that this Psalm 83 is actually the next war. All right? And look, at the rest of the, the psalm tells us what God's going to do to them. So I, I'm not going to take the time with that, but I'm actually done right now. Okay? Let's stand up. We did okay with time, right? We finished? Now, I know when you hear me talk about war, you don't like it, right? No. Come on. Do I like talking about it? No. But wouldn't you rather be warned about it? Would you rather know it's coming? Then, then it just happened and your pastor doesn't know anything about it. Which one would you rather that I knew it was going to happen or that I didn't know? I'm telling you it's going to happen. It's going to happen soon. China, what's happening in the Pacific is a great concern. What's happening in Russia is a great concern. This thing could turn into a world war. It really has the earmarks of it. All of the problems that were there in the First World War and the Second World War, they're there now again. Okay? Well, I'm telling you, God is in it. God is in it. That's all you need to know. God is in it. Amen? We do not have to be afraid. We do not have to be terrified. We, we have every reason to be excited. No, we're not excited to see anyone hurt or war, and we hate that. But we are excited because God is intervening in the nations, and the kingdom of Messiah is about to come Amen. soon. Amen. Amen? Let's pray. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, you're all ready to eat, and I'm talking. So, Lord, how many of you find this exciting? Yes, very much. It is. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just thank you that you are the God of Israel. You are God, our God. You are our God. The Lord is our God. Amen. He loves you. He cares about you. He's watching over us, too. We are his special people. We are his bride, the bride of Messiah. You understand? This doesn't put the church down. It raises us up. It's the opposite message. But Israel has a very special place to God also, as a nation. Amen? So, Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in Israel. Lord, we know they're very stubborn people, and we know that sometimes they can be very hard to love. But, Lord, you love them. Oh, but believe me, if you fly on one of those planes with them, you'll know what I'm talking yeah. about, as I have <laughs> many times. They take your seat and they stand up all in front of you all during the trip and, and they're going, you know. <laughs> but they're God's people and they're, they're hungry for him. Amen. They are. We watched last night a video of, a, of a, um, a Levite, a young fellow who sings and he's a Levite and he's waiting for the temple so that he can worship God and, and serve the people. So God is doing stuff, folks. Amen? So, Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for this group of people here who love you. We thank you for the church that you're planting here and building here. And, Lord, it's not together yet.